This is predictable, isn't it? Hammond ended up in a hospital in Switzerland. I ended up in a hospital in Mallorca. And James ended up in a hospital in Earl's Court. Oh, well, I don't see any reason. James has been in hospital with an unspecified illness he won't tell us about. There was something wrong with... So we sent him a chicken vindaloo to his hospital room. Uh, well, I'm perfectly better. Uh, I was only in hospital very briefly, and it was effectively a severe food poisoning, if you like, which damaged my stomach a bit, or inflamed it, I should say. So uh, I was just on extremely strong drugs, so I had to remain under observation. Unlike the last big off I had when I damaged my head, I didn't this time, so I can't remember it. I remember passing the finishing line and I remember getting, getting a sense that oh, yeah, I might be overcooking this and then it started to go around and I knew, in fact I say on the film, and we are showing the film, it is in the show, um, yeah, it, I've crashed. I remember impacting twice with the ground, one of them broke my leg, and then I remember being upside down and in the air for quite a long time and thinking, the longer I'm in the air, the more this is going to hurt when I land and then it was a big impact. And then the medics were there, the next thing I know they're strapping me to a spine board. It was double pneumonia, but it wasn't near death because I'm made of stone and rock and steel and was therefore better in actually six days. When Jeremy Clarkson was in hospital, it provided medical science with a priceless opportunity to locate, identify and work out how to neutralise the twat virus, which could have helped advance society by several hundred years. But as far as I can make out, at least judging by the way he is since he returned, they didn't do that. And that was a, a massive wasted opportunity and I'm very disappointed. It's different because there were certain elements of season one where people told us they weren't entirely sure we'd got it right. And so we thought, well, we'll change those things and um, we'll be announcing in due course what the changes are, by which I mean when we thought of them. Um, uh, yeah, it's the, you don't persevere with things that are unpopular because that's stupid. So, yeah, we've got new, new ideas and new things we'll be doing in season two. It's, it's quite close to where I live, I admit, but crucially it's halfway between where Hammond and May live. So that they don't have to argue over about, oh, well, I need to come an hour and a half. Well, they both have an hour and a half to get there. And for me, it's, it's a short walk in my dressing gown. My views on this are crystal clear. You can't have buses and bicycles on the roads at the same time. They have to choose. You either have buses or bicycles. You say to the poor, you can either go on a bus or you can go on a bicycle, but you can't, you can't give them a choice because it's too dangerous. It's a nightmare now when you've got bus lanes and bicycle lanes all competing, or buses and bicycles competing for space in a six foot wide, eight foot wide gap. It's just going to be carnage. I'd go buses personally. Band buses? All of them. And you know, the, all of the knocks, all of the particulate and all of the stuff, it's, it's almost all from, from buses and trucks. We can't do anything about trucks because we have to have deliveries. But you can get rid of buses and just tell everyone if you can't afford a car, you get a bicycle. It's like China. It's what Corbyn will do. The BBC is a fabulous organisation. It is brilliant. Um, but having said that, I'm struggling to think about a single thing I miss. <laughs> No, because broadly speaking, it's exactly the people I work with are exactly the same, the crews are exactly the same. We still do and say, broadly speaking, what we want. So it's it's sort of the same working conditions for us, even though it's now our production company rather than rather than the BBC. But yeah, yeah, because it's the same now as it was then, and there's not much to miss if that makes sense. People often put it to us, oh, driverless cars, electric cars, hmm, that's going to be it for you, isn't it? No, not at all. Driverless cars, for one thing, autonomous cars, if it works, and it's going to, they're not there yet, but if and when it does, if that's just about speeding up our commutes, speeding up our boring journeys, if cars are buzzing along, updating their information and downloading it so effectively every autonomous car is the best and most experienced driver in the world, then it'll be safer and quicker, without a doubt. Great. 
at the same time, cars appeal to something within us. Cars chime with something primal, primitive, basic within us. It's an itch that needs to be scratched and has been since they started just a hundred or so years ago. That's not going to go away. We're consumers, we'll get what we demand. When somebody realises, okay, I can make an electric car, an electrical autonomous car, but these people want an interesting one. As soon as somebody makes one and people buy them that I can then zip off into the hills around Wales and enjoy and scratch that itch that's driven me to love cars all my adult life, then they'll sell loads of them and it's market forces. That's what dictates it. We don't have these things forced on us. We buy what we want, so people make what we want. So we'll, it won't go away. I'm not worried at all. In fact, there's probably never been a more exciting time to talk about our subject.